All right, good morning. Let's go to John chapter number 21, please. John chapter number 21 this morning. Last several lessons have been looking at focusing on the events after the resurrection of Jesus Christ before his ascension. And this chapter is one of those chapters that speaks of some of Jesus' dealings with his disciples after he's risen from the dead and before he ascended back into heaven in Acts chapter number 1. Um, let's go ahead and pray together, and then we'll look at this chapter and go through it verse by verse, and lots of really, really good, interesting lessons that we can learn from here. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Lord, try to teach your word. Pray that you'd be with us. Pray that you'd help us, Lord. We really, really are in need of your help this morning, uh, this evening, throughout this whole day as we try to worship you, as we try to learn about you, as we try to fellowship with one another and uh, grow in the Lord, we, we could sure use your help. And so we pray that you'd uh, be with us and that you'd guide us, help me to say the right things in the right way that would be helpful to your people. Pray for the other classes that are meeting right now as well, that you'd bless them. And Lord, we love you. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. John chapter number 21 and verse number one says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. Look over at verse number 14. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So Jesus Christ rose from the dead, was resurrected from the grave. And the Bible says in Acts chapter number 1, from that point for a span of 40 days, Jesus showed himself to his disciples, showed himself to his people, showed himself alive. And this particular account is the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. Now, it's not the third time that Jesus showed himself to anyone. If you remember, there was a couple times that Jesus showed himself to people individually, but this is the third time that Jesus showed himself to the group of the disciples since he rose from the dead. In Acts chapter number 1, look at, you're right there, just look across the page, Acts chapter number 1. The Bible says, to whom also, verse number 3, he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Christ showed himself to mankind after his resurrection. And the Bible says that these post-resurrection appearances provide us with infallible proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We, we don't have, we, we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have faith in his resurrection. We have faith in his death. But we don't have what people call a blind faith. We have a faith that is based in infallible proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. What you have in your Bible is eyewitness testimony, eyewitness accounts of people who saw Jesus after he rose from the dead, spoke to Jesus after he rose from the dead, observed his works and his miracles after he was risen from the dead, and then they wrote down their testimony and said, I saw this with my very own eyes. You go to 1 Corinthians and Paul references over 500 brethren who saw him at one time. And were willing to say, testify, yet yeah, the greater part which remained to this day, the, the passage said, those people would have testified at that day if you would have been able to find them and speak to them. They would have said, yes, I've seen Jesus Christ alive after he rose from the dead. I saw him teach. I spoke with him. And the Bible speaks of this as infallible proof. Eyewitness testimony recorded in a book and passed down would be, would be valid historical evidence for any other fact. Everything that you know about history is because somebody saw it and they wrote it down, they recorded it. And you have over 500 people who said, I testify that I've seen Jesus Christ alive after his death and I'm willing to write it down in a book and I'm willing to testify to that fact. So we have infallible proof that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. The Bible says that these proofs were so infallible that men had to be paid off to tell lies about what happened. That's Matthew chapter number 28. They had to pay those prison guards money in order to get them to lie about what they saw. That's how, that's how infallible, how sure, how certain these proofs are in your Bible. So don't, don't let anybody tell you that, that you've got a blind faith 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm okay with faith. Look, without faith, it's impossible to please God. The Bible doesn't try to make a necessarily a case for the existence of God. It, it requires you to believe that God is. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. But our faith is not just in, in uh, cunningly devised fables. Our faith is in eyewitness testimony of a risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ appeared to his disciples uh, many times after he rose from the dead into different people. It's a really interesting study. I believe somebody else has already covered it, so we won't go through it in detail. But it's a really interesting study to get those gospel accounts in the book of Acts and 1 Corinthians and try to put all those together and see uh, who fits in where, what, in what order these post-resurrection appearances took place, who Jesus appeared to at what time, at what place. And depending on how you put that thing together, some people conflate some of the accounts, some people separate them. Uh, some people say as few as seven different appearances. Some people say uh, ten or more. And there could be a lot more that, that weren't recorded. And so, really interesting study. If you get a chance to, to do that, be a blessing. It was a blessing to me. But like we said, our passage in John 21 is the third appearance to the disciples. And it took place in Galilee. That's what this, this Sea of Tiberias is, the Sea of Galilee. You see that in verse number one. Um, and so it's likely that these men were in Galilee to meet with Jesus as they were appointed in Matthew 26 and Matthew 28. Get those two chapters for me. You get Matthew 26 and Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew 26 and Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew 26 and verse number 32, before Jesus Christ died, look at this. He tells his disciples, back up to verse 31. Then Jesus saith unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. So Jesus says, when I'm risen from the dead, this is prior to his crucifixion, he says, I'm going to die, I'm going to be smitten, I'm going to rise from the dead, and I'm going to go before you into Galilee. Look at Matthew chapter number 28. This is after he's risen from the dead. Matthew 28, look at verse number 10. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. So pretty clear, Jesus is instructing his disciples to go to Galilee, and when they go to Galilee, they will get to see him. Look down at verse number um, 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. So you get a little bit more detail. Jesus had appointed them a mountain in Galilee where they were to meet with him, okay? So kind of keep that area, keep a hand over there in Matthew 28 and come back to John chapter number 21. Here's the order of events that got the disciples here into Galilee. Remember, they're, they're by the Sea of Tiberias, so they're in Galilee, probably because they're meeting or supposed to meet with Jesus. And the best that I can tell, here's what got them there. One, Jesus tells his disciples he'll go before them in Galilee, like we just read in Matthew chapter number 26. Then Jesus rises from the dead and appears to the women, instructing them to tell the disciples to meet him in Galilee, like we just read in Matthew chapter number 28. The disciples, as we read in that chapter, don't, don't believe the women, and so they remain in Jerusalem. Jesus then appears to the disciples in Jerusalem, once without Thomas, and then eight days later with Thomas. That's John chapter number 20. So... Mary comes and says, hey, you've got to go to Galilee. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And they seemed like idle tales. They didn't quite believe it. They weren't sure what to make of it. And so Jesus has to show up to them in Jerusalem and say, hey, I really am alive. And I really need you to go to Galilee like I told you all the way back in Matthew 26 and told you again in Matthew chapter number 28. He appears to them twice in John 20. And then appears the disciples go to Galilee to meet with the Lord like the Lord told the women in Matthew chapter number 28. Now here is where we get into maybe a little bit of speculation or assumption, but I'll give you poss the possibilities. The Bible says in Matthew 28, 16, that the appointed meeting place in Galilee was a mountain, right? Remember that? He said, I'm going to meet you in a mountain in Galilee. 
But in John chapter 21, where do we find the disciples? Look at verse number 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. They are in Galilee, but they're not in a mountain. In fact, they're kind of at the opposite of a mountain. <laughs> they're at a lake. The, the lowest lying freshwater lake in the world. They're about as far from a mountain in Galilee as a person could get. So why are they on a lake in Galilee on a fishing trip instead of in the mountain where Jesus had appointed them? Well, there's a couple possibilities. The question that I was asking is, was this fishing trip that we're about to read about, was this an act of disobedience? Was this the disciples intentionally absent from the mountain? Or were they in Galilee awaiting the specific details of the meeting place, which was maybe given to them on the seashore later on in the chapter? Were they in the wrong place and just entirely disobeying what Jesus had told them to do? Or did Jesus say, go to Galilee and I'll give you further instructions? And then they meet with Jesus in the end of John chapter 21. And he says, now I want you to go into this mountain. I'm not exactly sure. My first instinct says there's no way that they would disobey the Lord after he rose from the dead and appeared unto them. There's no way that after they saw the risen Savior that they would completely ignore his instructions and go to the wrong place and not listen to what he said. But then if you think about it, these men walked with Jesus Christ for over three years. They watched the miracles that he worked. They watched him feed 5,000 with just, just a little bit of food. They watched him raise people from the dead. They watched him heal blind people. They watched him make lame people walk. And he said, I'm going to go to the cross. And I'm going to die and I'm going to rise from the dead. And they didn't believe him. They said, no, you're not. And then after he went to the cross, they didn't believe that he'd risen from the dead. So it's, it's very, very possible that these men were simply disobeying Jesus and they were not where they were supposed to be. Certainly possible that they didn't believe him this time. Maybe they went to the mountain that Jesus had appointed to them and maybe they waited for 10, 15, 20 minutes, half a day and said, well, I guess he's not coming. I guess we thought he was going to be here, but he must have been lying. And they looked down and saw that lake and said, I know, let's do, let's go fishing. And they left that place uh, because they were not patient and weren't waiting on the Lord. There's another possibility. Maybe Jesus appointed them this meeting place, but they didn't go because they weren't paying attention. Look back at Matthew chapter number 26. Jesus says in verse number 32, But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Then, look at verse 33, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. You know, it's a very likely possibility because, G because Peter was offended by what, Jesus, by what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter number 26. He missed the details of Jesus' instructions. Jesus said, I want you to go to Galilee after that, I'm crucified, and after you deny me. And Peter says, how dare you say I'm going to deny you? I don't want to hear anything else you have to say. I'm going to argue with that right there. And because he's so offended, because he's upset with what the, the truth of the Bible, Peter misses the details of the instructions, and so he's not where he should be. If you retract, reject truth from God, you very well could be cutting yourself off from further truth. Maybe Jesus was going to give him the details of where to be and where to meet after his resurrection. And because Peter was so offended and didn't want to hear it, Peter didn't like what Jesus was saying. He missed the instructions and missed the details. Back to Jack, uh, John chapter number 21. John 21. Look at verse number 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself... There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana of Ga in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately and that night they caught nothing. Now, Peter receives a lot of grief for this fishing trip, which at first glance to some might seem unfair, but there's because honestly, there's nothing wrong with going fishing. There's nothing wrong with taking a little bit of time. There's nothing wrong with a hobby, but there's several things here 
that we need to consider. These men are not taking a fishing pole with a worm and a bobber and unwinding on the lakeside for an hour or two. These men are using nets, which they forsook in Matthew chapter number 4. These men are on a ship, which they had left to follow Jesus in Mark chapter number 1. These men aren't taking a leisurely fishing trip. They're working all night long. They're toiling all night long, the Bible says, trying to catch fish. Look at verse number 3. That night they caught nothing. These aren't men who were once carpenters or cobblers or blacksmiths or tent makers. Before they met Jesus, these men were commercial, professional fishermen. That was their living. That was their life. That is what defined them prior to meeting Jesus Christ. If you asked them what they were, who they were, what they did, they would say, we are fishermen. Peter saying, I go a fishing, is much more significant than if you or I were to say, I go a fishing. If I go a fishing, it's going to be for an hour or two, and I'm not going to catch anything, probably no matter which side of the boat I cast my line on. <laughs> and I certainly am not going to make a living doing it. But Peter's fishing trip is much different. This isn't just a waste of time or a distraction from his responsibilities that the Lord had given him. Peter's fishing trip signifies a return to their old life before they met Jesus. A return to their old way of living prior to their meeting or their encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not just taking up a hobby. They're not just trying to kill some time while they're waiting to meet with the Lord. When he gets in a boat with a net and goes out all night long trying to catch as many fish possible, he is returning to his former life. Now I understand there's a balance here. There's nothing wrong with the job. There's nothing wrong with the career. But Think about this. These men had a truly life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. They worked alongside him for his earthly ministry. They listened to, to God manifest in the flesh, teaching the scriptures. They received new revelation directly from the mouth of God. They watched him work miracles. They saw the Lord crucified. They saw the empty tomb. They've now seen the Lord at least twice since his resurrection, and some of them had seen him maybe even more. According to John chapter number 20, they've received, at least to some extent, the Holy Spirit. And after all of that excitement calmed down, after all of that experience with the Lord Jesus Christ, that life-changing three years with Jesus Christ... They decide to go back to their plain old normal life as though they'd never met him. They decide to go back to a state of living that's maybe not necessarily wrong because the Bible doesn't say it's wrong to be a fisherman. But they decide to go back to their life as though they had never met Jesus Christ in the first place. They go back to a plain old life, a plain old living, a plain old normal job, a plain old normal... They, they start living as though they had never met Christ. I understand that these disciples' calling probably looks a lot different than maybe your calling or my calling. I understand that th what Jesus was having these men do specifically is a little bit different than maybe what Jesus is having us to do specifically. So I'm not saying that if you have a job, then you're just going back to your old life and you're not, you're not living for the Lord, you're not doing right. But, but your life after meeting Jesus Christ should not just be a, a three-year stint of excitement. It should not be just a short time of, wow, I got saved, and I'm excited, and I'm full of the Spirit, and I can't wait to witness, and I can't wait to, wait to read my Bible, and I can't wait to go to church. And then as time goes on, as things wear down, as things become normal, you return to a state of life that, that was almost as though you'd never met him in the first place. That's not how it ought to be. Yeah. And so Peter has this really exciting experience with, with Jesus. The disciples have this really exciting sort of three and a half year time period with Jesus and then it's over and they say well I guess he's gone back to heaven I guess he's not meeting with us in Galilee like like we supposed he was I guess I guess this is you know it was a good run but let's go a fishing and they return to a, a very much normal life as though they hadn't met Christ look at what happened look at what results from doing something like this number one they caught nothing Look again in verse number 3. Simon Peter saith unto him, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we go also with thee. 
They went forth and entered in a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. When a person gets saved, but then tries to go back and find fulfillment and joy in the old way of living, if you're a saved Christian, you're trying to find satisfaction, even in th things that, that aren't wrong, right? It's not wrong to have a job. It's not wrong to have a family. It's not wrong to have a career. It's not wrong to, to have hobbies. It's not wrong to have pastimes. But if you're trying to find your joy and your excitement and your satisfaction in those things, you'll be like these disciples. You'll catch nothing. You'll find nothing there. As a Christian with the Holy Spirit living inside of you, your source of joy, your source of satisfaction, what makes your life worth living is the Lord Jesus Christ and serving him and living for him. So these men go back to their old way of life and say, let's see what we can find any sort of joy here. And the Bible says that they caught nothing. They had nothing to show for it. No joy, no peace, no excitement, no satisfaction in the things of the world. Number two, they left little time or energy for the things of the Lord. They were fishing all night long, and I doubt the next morning they felt very much like witnessing. I doubt the next morning they had very much time or energy for Bible study. And there's a danger, guys, there's a danger if you're a saved Christian and try to live your life for the things of the world, or you go back to focus on those things, or those are the main part of your life, Jesus Christ is the main focus of your life, if you're not careful, you'll be so consumed with hobbies and pastimes and trying to make money and trying to make more money, you won't have any time or you won't have any energy left to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with your life. There's only so many hours in a day. There's only so much you can do with a life. And none of these things are maybe wrong, none of these things are maybe bad, but... If those are your focus, if that's the, the main area in which you spend your time and you don't leave time or energy to serve the Lord, that's, that's not right for a Christian. That's not right for a Christian. Number three, notice that they were out of fellowship with a lot of other Christians. Verse number two, there were together Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other Disciple, the two other of his disciples. My count, that's, that's six people. Did I get that wrong? Simon? How, doesn't matter. It's not all of them. It's just a few of them, right? They're out of fellowship with other believers. The Bible says that Jesus appeared unto 500 brethren at once in 1 Corinthians. In the next book of Acts, we see at least 120 brethren meeting in the upper room. These guys go off by themselves to do their thing, do their little hobby, do their little pastime. They're, they're trying to make some money on this side. And what are they doing? They're cutting themselves off from fellowship with other believers. Yeah. They're taking time. They're taking a time where they should have been with other Christians seeking the Lord and serving the Lord. And because they're so busy with other things, now there's just a few of them on a boat by themselves. That's a real danger. You get too caught up in the things of the world. You get caught, too caught up in things in your, in your past life or too caught up in, in, in just stuff. And before you know it, you'll be out of fellowship. You won't be spending the time with other believers or spending the time with the Lord that you could be if you weren't so wrapped up in those other things. And then number four, notice that old hobbies provoke old habits. Look at, look at verse number seven. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Peter is out on the water on his boat, and the Bible says that he doesn't have a shirt on. And it's also interesting to note that the Bible describes this condition as being naked. And uh, easy to preach side note is, why is it when people get around water, they feel like it's okay to display their nakedness? Peter gets on a boat and the clothes come off. People get by the beach and they think there's, there's some sort of exception. You know, the Bible says be clothed in modest apparel, but unless you're going swimming. And people say, well, I can't go swimming if I don't dress like this or undress like this. Or, well, then don't go swimming if you can't do it without being in line with the Bible. If there's an activity you can't do without disobeying the scriptures, you'd be better off just not doing that activity. So, Peter, Peter wouldn't have been in this condition if he hadn't returned to his old way of life. And often when you go back to your old life, your old habits, your old hobbies, even if they're not wrong, even if they're not sinful, but you get in touch with old friends. You get in touch with some of the old habits. You get in touch with some of the old music 
You get in touch with some of the old vices. You get around some of the things that, that gave you trouble in the past. I don't think if Peter was where he should have been with all the other disciples and in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, they would have pulled his shirt off. I think, Jesus, or I think Peter would have been completely clothed. I think Peter would have been where he should have been and he would have been provoked uh, to be doing this. It's interesting to see that as soon as the Lord shows up, Peter all, all of a sudden feels convicted. All of a sudden, Peter's, I, I got to get some clothes on. The Lord's here. And just something to think about, the, the Lord's always here. People come to church, they dress one way outside of church, they come to church and dress a different way because, well, that's the Lord's house and I, you know, I've got I've to be modest when I'm... But you know the Lord's always with you if you're saved? You know the Lord's living inside of you if you're saved? People dress a lot of the way out, out in life, they'd never dress in front of the Lord, but they are in front of the Lord. <laughs> Lord sees you uh, where you are and knows what you're doing and so... You ought to dress to honor him all the time. Peter out there living the old life, and he just starts to slip. He just starts to slip. Well, you know, he's, he's not around. He's just around his buddies, and, and okay, but he's starting to slip. He's starting to go back to some of the old things, and I wonder if, it, if Jesus hadn't pulled him out of that, if he'd continue, what, it, what would have been next? Would it have been some of those old words he used to use? Would it have been some of those old, right? He's just starting to slip back. So nothing wrong with going fishing. Nothing wrong with, but provoking old habits in Peter. So again, there's a balance here. Nothing wrong with some of these things. Nothing wrong with the job. We're commanded to work. We're commanded to provide. We're commanded to eat our own bread. But you don't want to return back to how it was before you met Jesus when those things were all you had to live for. We have more to live for now than just those things. We have something that is so much more important than just those things. Has a biblical place in our life, but make sure we keep those things in their biblical place in our life. There's also an important lesson here concerning leadership. If you are a leader, either by personality or by position, it's very important that you choose to lead people in the right direction. Look again in verse number two. They're together, Simon, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, Zebedee, two other disciples. Simon, Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. I think it's pretty obvious from the verse, if Peter hadn't made that suggestion, none of them would have ever went in the first place. Peter, if you look through the scriptures, seems to have a very strong leadership personality. And Jesus eventually gives him a leadership position as a kind of a leader in the first New Testament, in the beginning of the New Testament church. And because of that personality and because of that position, Peter can easily sway other people to choose to do things that maybe they weren't on their radar in the first place, or maybe they weren't going to do if he hadn't led them in that way. So if you have a leadership sort of personality, you need to be very careful. Just a couple chapters later, you get to Acts chapter number one, Acts chapter number two, early part of the book of Acts, we see Peter as a very bold leader leading the charge on the day of Pentecost, leading the charge in preaching in the temple, leading the charge in the early church. So he's able to use that same personality for good, And if you're that sort of person, you need to work to lead people in the service of the Lord. If you're given a leadership position, whether by man or by God, maybe you're a father and you've got that God-given responsibility as the leader of your family. I don't have a very leadership personality. doesn't matter. You've been given the leadership of your family. And you can use that position to lead your family in service to the Lord and lead them in the right direction. So very, very significant here that Peter steers all these people in one direction or the other. All right, come to verse 4. Let's read verse 4 through 6 here. Try to get some of this stuff running out of time. The Bible says, When the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fish. So they haven't caught anything all night. All night long, professional fishermen, maybe a little rusty after three years of not doing it, but professional fishermen trying to catch fish, can't catch them. Jesus shows up and says, throw the net on the other side of the boat, and now they've caught so many that they can't even pull the net into the boat. This interaction is strikingly similar 
to what took place when the Lord first called his disciples in Luke chapter number 5. Hold John 21, get Luke chapter number 5. Look at Luke 5. Verse number 1, it came to pass that as the people were pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. This is the same lake, another name for the Sea of Galilee. And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So Simon Peter, on a boat, fishing all night long, didn't catch anything. Jesus comes in the boat, says, cast out your nets. He says, I mean, we've been trying, but I'll do it if you... If you say so. Notice he says net. Jesus instructed nets. Plural. And that's probably why they end up breaking. Look at verse number six. When they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that they were with him, at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. So a very similar interaction But the first one was at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The second one was when Jesus Christ had already risen from the dead. Now, it's really interesting. It seems that Peter had met Jesus in John chapter number 1, but for whatever reason didn't start following Jesus until after this encounter in Luke chapter number 5. He may have been running from the Lord's will. may have been that he didn't want to follow Jesus for whatever reason. Or maybe he was concerned about his ability to provide for himself and for his family if he left all to follow Christ. If he walked away from his nets, walked away from his family business, walked away from his boats, maybe he was concerned, if I follow this man Jesus Christ entirely, how am I going to provide for myself? And so Jesus Christ shows up and teaches Peter that he's able to provide for Peter just fine. These men forsake their nets and their ship and their family business, and they follow the Lord. But after following Jesus for three years, these disciples end up right back where they started. They're on the exact same lake. They're fishing all night long. They're catching nothing. Three years following the Lord. Three years listening to him teach. Watching him die. Knowing he's risen from the dead. And I don't know why, but they're, they're going back to this same state as though, Jesus, as though they'd never met Jesus. Maybe it was the same sort of thing. Maybe they weren't willing now that they saw what it could cost them to follow Jesus. Maybe they were scared that they'd be the next ones on a cross. Maybe he was frightened about providing for his family. We thought that he was going to bring in the kingdom and everything was going to be okay, but he didn't bring in the kingdom, and so now we're going to have to do something to be able to, you know, make a living and provide for ourselves. But Jesus is there. And over three years later, after they failed to believe him and failed to trust him and failed to obey him, he's willing to stand on that same seashore and patiently teach them the same lesson again. They're in almost the exact same situation, only now with so much more experience and so much more knowledge and and a Holy Spirit living inside of them, and they go and they mess up and they make the same mistake again. They have the same failure. They're in the same, in the same boat. <laughs> and the same Savior on the same beach says, hey, let me teach you this lesson again. Let me patiently take you by the hand and show you again what I tried to teach you three years ago. And I'm going to teach you in a very similar manner because maybe you just didn't get it the first time. 
You ever feel like in your Christian life there's just some things that you really should have had down a long time ago? Or maybe there's some things that you did have down a long time ago, and then you say, well, where did this come from? I thought I dealt with that 10 years ago. I thought we had that ironed out three years after I got saved, and now we're dealing with this again. Now this doubt or this fear or this trouble's rising up in my, in my life again. I have this temptation, this habit, this shortcoming, this disobedience in my life again. I, I, I thought I took care of this. The Lord's going to be so disappointed with me that I've, I fell to this again. The Lord's going to be so upset with me that I'm still struggling with this. The Lord's not going to use me anymore after he sees that, that I just can't get over this or I just can't get through that. And we find the Lord Jesus Christ patiently waiting by the same seashore, ready to teach us the same lesson again. Say, here, maybe you didn't get it the first time. Let's go over the ABCs again. Let's go over the one, two, threes again. Let's, let's try this again. And then you see the Lord Jesus Christ take these disciples ashore and minister to them and help them and teach them and send them back out into the world and, and use them to do a great work for him. Praise the Lord for how good he is to us. Praise the Lord for how patient he is with us. I'm glad the Lord has more patience with me than I do with myself or with other people. I'm glad the Lord is willing to work with me and help me and be long-suffering towards me and work with me through all my troubles and all my shortcomings. Look at verse number nine quickly. Uh, verse number eight, rather, sorry. And the other disciples came on a little ship, for they're not far from land, for as were 200 cubits dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish lay thereon. And bread, Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Now notice that these disciples didn't catch anything when they were fishing by themselves. But when Jesus showed up, they were quite successful in their, in their fishing endeavor. And I think that can be applied to our witnessing. We're out there trying to win the, the world by ourselves. That's not how it's supposed to be. Mark chapter number 16 says that the Lord was working with them to spread the gospel throughout the world, Mark 16, verse number 20. And so when we go out witnessing, we need to make sure that the Lord is working with us. That's not something we're doing by ourselves. We need to be prayed up. We need to be studied up. We need to be in fellowship with the Lord uh, so that he'll be working with us. But verse number 9 is really interesting. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread Jesus had fish already cooking when the disciples showed up. So obviously he was perfectly capable of getting his own fish without the help of these men. But he gave the disciples a work to do. And when that work was com a, a work that they were completely unable to accomplish by themselves. They tried, they couldn't do it. But after they finished doing the work that Jesus honestly did for them... Look what the Lord says in verse number 10. Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. So they tried all night to catch fish, couldn't catch anything. Christ had his own fish, was per per perfectly capable of catching his own fish. But Jesus said, okay, I'm going to use you to catch a whole lot of fish. And then when you bring them back to shore, Jesus isn't going to say, look at all the fish. that You wouldn't have been able to catch those fish if it weren't for me. Jesus said, wow, good job. Look at all the fish that you guys caught. You guys are really good fishermen. Bring all the fish that ye have caught. And you know what? The Lord doesn't need our help reaching the world. The Lord could reach all the lost people himself if he, if he wanted to. He doesn't have to use us. But the Lord Jesus Christ has given us a work to do that we are completely unable to do ourselves. He has chosen to use us as ambassadors of Christ to pray the world in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. The only way we're ever going to be successful in reaching the world is through his help. But, but when, we, when we get done, he's going to give us a crown as though we really had anything to do with it. And he's going to reward us and give us a crown for our labors in his field that really we couldn't have done without his help. Who wouldn't want to serve that Lord? Who wouldn't want to serve that Jesus? He'll help you do the work. He'll enable you to do the work. And then when the work gets done, he'll say, good job, my good and faithful servant. And give us rewards for our labor. Well, we're about out of time. Unfortunately, I won't be able to tell you what the 153 fish are, I know the answer, but 
I can't, I can't tell you because we're out of time here. The rest of the chapter, Jesus asks Peter three times, very famous passage, do you love me? Do you love me? Reckoning back to the three denials of the Lord that Peter made. And, you know, that's, that's really important because the question of Peter's denial was not, well, Peter, did you right? Did you wrong? Did you? The question was whether or not Peter loved the Lord. When we sin, when we're tempted, when we're tried, the question is whether or not we love the Lord. And then Jesus follows that up with, do you love me? Okay, then serve me. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. And the evidence of our love for God is not in our words. The evidence of our love for God is in our actions. And so when we're tempted, like Peter was tempted, it's really just a test of whether or not we love the Lord. That's what he's concerned about. And if we say we love him, then let's keep his commandments like he told us to do. Amen.